All right, good evening. Hello, welcome to Science Never Stops with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. My name is David Weichel, and I'm the Planetarium Director at the Intuitive Planetarium at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. And I am very excited to talk with you all about Pluto and answer the question, is Pluto a planet or not, uh, this evening? And that should be all sorts of fun. So uh, as we're giving people a chance to tune in here, let me pull up a quick poll for you. And let's see, what do you think? Is Pluto a planet or not? Let's see if this worked. Okay, so you should see somewhere, actually I don't know where it, where it shows up, but somewhere you should see a poll uh, asking if Pluto is a planet or not. And you can give me your, your answer. Um, while you are answering the poll though, uh, let's first off gaze at uh, really the, the beauty that is Pluto. And, oh, okay, cool, it's popping up on your screen, fantastic. I see that now. Uh, let's gaze at the beauty that is Pluto here. And you can see that um, Pluto is far from the sort of bluish, purplish, uh, sort of tiny icy object that we thought of it was maybe, uh, well, before the New Horizons spacecraft flew by. And it's uh, a much more interesting world than we could have imagined and a much more dynamic world uh, than we could have imagined as well. Uh, also, a question for the audience, um, and this is something you can type in the in the comments as you're uh, jumping into this. Uh, where is everyone joining us from this evening? Very cool. So so far, I'm getting no updates. So if you're if you're typing, then type and hit enter. If you're not typing, then that's also cool. You don't have to talk to me. No worries there. All right, so before we answer this question of is Pluto a planet, planet, or not, my friends are telling me to scroll down a little bit. Well, let's see. It looks as though answers are not coming in. Very cool. Okay, now they are. Fantastic. So, Colin, you are from Atlanta. Fantastic. It'd be great to meet you someday. Terry from Birmingham, hello. Adrian from Huntsville, hello. Laura from Madison. And thank you for watching the black hole video last week, Laura and son. That's super cool. Tyler, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Very cool. Okay, so uh, in, this, in this shot that you can see right in here, we actually have two worlds. Uh, we have Pluto sort of in the foreground, and we have its largest moon, Charon, in the background. And uh, again, I want to sort of point out that uh, before we get too far into things, Pluto is a much more, um, I guess, dynamic and fascinating world than we initially imagine. So Pluto has these five moons, in fact. Uh, so the largest is Charon, that's what you saw there, but we also have Nix, Styx, Kerberos, and Hydra. Uh, those four are quite, quite small. And this entire system is, is rather small as well. But when Pluto was first discovered in 1930 by an American astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh, he was looking up at the night sky, and he was searching for planets. And he basically would take a picture, and he would take another picture of the exact same spot in the sky, but he would do so maybe a few weeks apart. And he would use what's called a slide comparator, and he would sort of flick between these two pictures really quickly. And it's something that computers uh, struggle with um, a little bit, uh, or at least it's, it's a little bit difficult for us to program them to do that. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, but human eyes are very um, adept at noticing these small little changes. So he was able to, in taking pictures of a, a wide swath of the night sky, he was able to finally find something that was moving against the background stars, which indicates that it's a good bit closer if it's moving in the time frame of, say, two to three weeks. And so eventually he was able to pin down uh, from more observations that this little tiny dot was indeed a planet. Uh, we were able to narrow down sizing uh, after a period of time. But it wasn't um, even until uh, about 78, 1978, when 
um, Sharon was first discovered. And then we didn't get uh, the next two planets, or next two moons out of this um, until I think in the, the 90s or so. And then when Hubble looked at it, and then we didn't get the last two moons, uh, Styx and Kerberos, until um, actually after the New Horizons spacecraft had launched. So that was a pretty, pretty wild thing. Okay, so let's see. Uh, more people chiming in. Cool shirt. Thank you so much. I may have worn this last week. My wife said not to say that, but uh, I did wash it since then. Don't worry. Um, very exciting. Um, hello to... I think it's either Gary or Jerry from Pittsburgh. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Dan from Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. Very cool. Anthony from Tampa. And Scott, who's raised in the Rocket City. Hello from Atlanta. Fantastic. So the New Horizons spacecraft is something that has really been... Um, had really been thought out for a very long time because, of course, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, launched um, in the uh, 70s, 1977. Um, when they were launched, the intent was to include Pluto initially, and then uh, in order to get a nice view of different moons, that idea was quickly uh, quickly dropped, unfortunately. So it took a lot of different uh, mission proposals in order for us to get uh, these amazing pictures of Pluto with the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, it was launched in uh, January of 2006, and it took nine and a half years, July 14th of 2015, before it flew by Pluto uh, very, very quickly and gave us unprecedented imagery. So let's let's dive into this a bit. Uh, before we get any closer, let me bring over my mouse here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. And I'm going to draw out what looks to be sort of a heart on Pluto. And uh, it essentially is this is sort of Pluto's beating heart. Uh, it's, it's very nice, very nice uh, analogy of Pluto loves you whether you love it or not, or other people love it or not. Um, but Pluto's heart is a very, very icy heart. It's a very cold place. Um, all of Pluto is quite cold at about 370 degrees Fahrenheit below zero on a pretty standard day. So Pluto is quite, quite, quite cold. And if we look at that heart region, especially the left or left sort of lobe, as opposed to uh, this material, this, this region uh, to the left of the left lobe, the west of the left lobe, right now north is up for us, you can see that there's all sorts of cracks, cratering, looks like scratches, all sorts of weird things going on in here, but this seems very, very smooth, or at least a good bit smoother. No craters. So let's jump back into this a bit. So if you can see any craters, and uh, I didn't realize this was still on the screen, so let me pull down your uh, this pole here for you so you don't have to see that anymore. And we can resolve that. And you can see the results if you so desire. Okay, so as we start to zoom in here, you'll notice that there are no craters um, whatsoever in this region. And there are some, some funky looking things, sure, um, but, but no craters. And that's sort of bizarre. Sort of bizarre indeed. So as we sort of pan up a little bit, you can get this sense of, hmm, what is going on here? There seem to be almost like these frozen, frozen rivers or so, and it's it's peculiar. So what you're seeing, rather, is that Pluto has this sort of glacial region in this left lobe uh, that is um, actually not water ice mostly, uh, but basically uh, nitrogen, uh, molecular nitrogen with a little bit of water ice. And even at these really, really cold temperatures of 370 degrees below zero, Pluto is still very, very... It's, it's very, very... Uh, or the, this heart is very, very slushy, I guess, or a sort of so semi-slushy, um, to the point of it's solid if you were to stand on it, but if you put a lot of mass on it, it would kind of um, move around a good bit. And we actually see that this glacier does move around and sort of creep around the surrounding area as we get a little bit closer in here. That's 
that's noticeable um, in this region. Right in here you can see this glacier sort of creeping in the lower lying areas. Uh, so that's just like uh, we experience on the Earth as well, which is pretty cool. So sort of to the side of this in here, you can see these sort of rough patches, much different than these right in here. And so uh, this is, oh, I'm on the wrong screen. So rough patches in here, as opposed to right in here. Uh, these are mountain ranges. And these mountains are very different uh, from that of the Earth in that they are actually made of water ice. So at these frigid temperatures, uh, while the nitrogen ice is kind of slushy, the water ice actually has the same structural integrity or similar structural integrity as rock on the Earth. And so when we look at Pluto sort of from far away, we can make out these interesting mountain ranges that basically uh, surround the heart, especially on the left side in here, in this glacial plain in the interior. So what does all of this mean? Well, the glacial plain in here is very fascinating, and you'll see the, the imagery change out as we get in a little bit closer. And let's see if I can adjust our view just a bit. There we go. So oh, what does all of this mean? Well, since we don't see any craters in here, it indicates that Pluto is uh, in some way sort of reshaping its surface. And this left lobe of the heart, which we call Sputnik Planitia, after the spacecraft Sputnik, the first one, well, the first spacecraft, the surface is basically reshaping itself, resurfacing itself, because of some sort of internal heat source that we don't fully understand. And since Pluto is so tiny, it's actually about two-thirds the size of our moon, and it's about four billion miles away from the sun. Uh, it's very, very, very cold, about 30 astronomical units away from the sun. Um, that's 30 times farther than the Earth, so very, very far away. Because it's so small, because it's so cold, and because there's nothing else interacting with it um, in a way that, uh, say, moons of Saturn or Jupiter do, uh, there's nothing to provide any internal heating uh, that we expected. But something is internally heating it, um, more than we expected because we do see this resurfacing. So it's almost as if uh, we have this sort of cosmic lava lamp effect where warmer, warmer material um, sort of rises to the top because it's a lower density than the cooler material, and the cooler material falls down uh, to the interior to be rewarmed uh, because it's uh, a heavier density. And so we can make out these very interesting um, sort of cell shapes in here. And uh, these are called convective cells, and the process is the same thing as watching a uh, pot of water boil, which, uh, contrary to popular belief, it will boil if, if you watch it. It won't be very fun, but it will boil. And Pluto, whether you watch it or not, is also boiling in a sense, except it's boiling these uh, ices, basically. And not so much boiling, just uh, slight warming, which causes this resurfacing. So this entire uh, surface is maybe as young as 10,000 to 100,000 years old, perhaps um, it, no more than 10 million years old, compared to the rest of Pluto, which is very, very old, um, some 4 billion years old. So if we move over to the sort of western side of this, you can see this very heavy cratering, this very dark material uh, as a result, and or not as a result. You can see this very dark material, and this material is the result uh, of the atmosphere of Pluto, which is very, very thin, um, some 2,000 times thinner than that of Mars, or 20 times thousands, 20,000 times thinner than that of Mars, um, and Mars is about um, 100 times thinner than the Earth. So you're looking at about uh, 200,000 to 2 million times thinner than the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but there is an atmosphere, it's mostly nitrogen, and there's different, uh, just like the Earth's, different uh, hydrocarbons in there as well. And the ultraviolet light from the sun actually breaks it apart, it dissociates these molecules, and they recombine to form much more complex hydrocarbons. And these precipitate out of the atmosphere, they essentially snow in this material called tholins, it's sort of this reddish sticky snow. And we do see that in a few other places in the solar system, uh, but pro uh, 
very prominently here on Pluto, and that's what gives it this sort of brownish reddish color. Um, what we're seeing in here is fairly true color, maybe slightly enhanced um, to pull some, some details, but uh, fairly true color. You'll notice that some regions um, are of much better resolution than others, and that's because Pluto's day um, is about six and a half Earth days or so, and New Horizons flew by at about 30-something thousand, 35,000 miles an hour. And so it was only able to take the best pictures over a, about a, well, 36-hour period for pretty much the entire flyby, um, and perhaps you know, only a few hours for the very, very best pictures, which are in this sort of uh, right about, let's zoom down, right about in here or so. So we're looking at about uh, maybe 230 meters per pixel in resolution, something like that, um, if my memory is correct. Okay, so Pluto has this funky heart, right? Funky heart that is uh, essentially beating uh, as like a cosmic lava lamp, like I said. It's got these strange mountains uh, that sort of, uh, that are water ice, and actually, because they're water ice, and because water ice has a lower density than that of this sort of slushy nitrogen, they're actually floating water ice mountains on Pluto. Uh, so that's super weird. Um, to give you a sense of perspective, uh, scale, these mountains in here, um, we're looking at these mountains and then down into these mountains. Uh, these are maybe the size of the Appalachian Mountains, maybe a, a touch a touch uh, bigger, perhaps, and then as we get further into the the further down mountain ranges, and here kind of coming down into this range, these rival the Rockies, um, and perhaps are even um, some cryovolcanoes down here, um, ice volcanoes. So that's a very strange concept, because on the Earth, uh, magma is very hot. Um, on a world that's very, very icy, magma can still be very cold, it's just warmer than the the other areas. Uh, you can also see some uh, regions of, let me bring my mouse over, there we go, of uh, sort of glacial creep going on and filling in some of these low-lying areas in here. Again, just like we see on the Earth. Okay, so moving back away, I'll bring my mouse back off the screen. Uh, moving back away, what is, how is this possible? Um, I already told you we don't really know, but um, some thoughts on this is that Pluto exhibits a good bit more radioactive decay in its interior than we first expected. So that would be uh, basically things like uh, uranium um, radioactively decaying into uh, other things, um, plutonium radioactively decaying, that kind of stuff. It is also likely that it has a good bit more insulation. And so if we move over here uh, in the interior, if we move over here to the west, and we look at this, um, this cracking over here, it looks as if Pluto has almost outgrown its skin, right? If you were to take a water balloon and fill it very, very, very full, almost to bursting, and then you froze it, that would probably burst, right? Um, and in the process, uh, it would at least, this water is going to expand and sort of burst at the seams. Well, that's sort of what it appears, what appears to have happened in here, that Pluto is sort of frozen in the inside and almost burst at its core, right? Well, that sort of works. Um, however, if you had enough water inside of Pluto uh, to account for densities and that sort of thing that we measure, uh, if you had enough water to account for all of this and it all froze, this internal liquid water ocean that then froze, you would have a scenario that's very different than what we experience um, with a water balloon because all of the water that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life is called water type 1. Um, there are many types of water, um, or ice type 1 rather is the, the solid form of that. There are many types of ice and um, if you get enough density and pressure you don't get water expanding when it freezes. It actually contracts like other solids. And so this is water type 2. And so if 
you were to have this much water, you'd actually see the opposite. You'd see these mountains sort of pushing up and no expansion cracks, but rather sort of fissures uh, or sort of uh, compression uh, cracking instead. And we don't see that on Pluto really at all. Uh, looking to the questions, put that on hold, we have a question, is the Earth flat? Uh, no, it isn't. And Pluto isn't either, and nor is any world. And try again with another question. Thank you. Uh, other question, how are those floating mountains kept in place if the atmosphere is very thin? Or what do you mean by floating? Ah, James, very good question. Sounds sort of existential almost. If we zoom into, I can say that, I know him. If we uh, zoom back in, um, the atmosphere is very, very thin. and They're not floating in the air, but they're sort of floating almost like an iceberg uh, on the ocean. So this sort of icy, slushy uh, glacial material in Sputnik Planitia, this sort of left lobe of the heart, because it's a, a higher density than the water ice mountains, these water ice mountains sort of bob almost uh, very, very slowly in the uh, sort of uh, slushy nitrogen. So very funky. And they also do uh, potentially move around, shift around a little bit. Um, but we didn't observe Pluto on timescales enough to uh, confirm that at all. Another question is, uh, are there volcanoes on Pluto? And if you are just chiming in, um, I did mention that there are potentially ice volcanoes, cryovolcanoes on Pluto. And someone says, I think what you're trying to do is fabulous. Thank you so much. Hello from Tucson. Very cool. Okay, so I lost my train of thought. We talked about uh, beating heart. We talked about floating mountains. We talked about... Um, red sticky snow called Tholins. Oh yes, we're zooming out too far so that Pluto's getting blurry. Let's zoom back in. Um, we are talking about how is Pluto warm inside? Okay, so if you have more radioactive decay and if you have a lot of water that froze, that doesn't work. But if you have radioactive decay and you have um, a lot of water that only partially freezes, some of the water freezes forming a nice insulator, not all of it freezes, some of it remains liquid, very, very cold, very, very salty, with some frozen sort of shell, perhaps. That acts as a very nice insulator between the two layers. And with all of that radioactive decay, you could potentially have enough to sort of fuel this uh, craziness that is this sort of cosmic lava lamp. Uh, so is that what's happening? I have no idea, and no one else really does either. Uh, but it's a, a very interesting thought, and one worth pursuing. So none of this answers the question, um, is Pluto a planet or not? Um, and someone is asking, how much gravity does Pluto have? Uh, I think we're looking at about 1 16th that of the Earth. Um, someone is asking, Colin is asking, can you drink the water? Uh, no, definitely, definitely don't want to do that. Because it's very salty, you're going to have things like perchlorates and other salts that are actually poisonous to you. So um, without... Uh, doing something drastic to sort of um, filter that, then you wouldn't want to just drink it if you could indeed get to it. Okay, so is Pluto a planet or not? Um, well, you have to sort of think about um, the entire solar system. So let's zoom back away from this for a moment. Actually, I'll tell you what. Here's what we'll do. I set up all these nice visuals that were sort of uh, pre-canned, and then I haven't clicked on any of them. So let me let me do that. Let's play the Pluto flyby. This is something really neat that we adapted for flat screen. Um, I should mention that the software we're using is called Digistar 6, and it's what we use in our planetarium. And it's been a little bit of um, some effort to get um, all of these visuals into something that are flat and functional, but uh, I think the result is pretty cool. So you're watching a representation of the New Horizons spacecraft down there in the sort of bottom of your screen in its flyby at about, um, let's see, five, I think it's five hours every, uh, no, five minutes every minute. That's what we're looking at. So it's a very, very quick, very, very quick flyby here, as you can see. And you can see it pointing its spacecraft at the, the different worlds here in the flyby and zooming by. So, as planets were being discovered, um, if we go back to 
the 1800s, right? Uh, people were aware of all the planets you could see with the naked eye. So that means Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then um, you've got you've got Uranus discovered, right? But then people start finding these other things that are sort of between Mars and Jupiter, and they find this thing called Ceres, and that's a neat world, an exciting world, uh, fairly bright. Uh, they find this other planet um, they call Pallas, they've got Juno, they've got Vesta. They, find, they start finding all these little different uh, worlds, and then they realize eventually that they're not all that big, and they're all situated sort of together between Mars and Jupiter, and uh, they recognize eventually that these probably are not the same kind of things as planets. Um, and these are the first four asteroids, and then they find several more. And now we're up to hundreds of thousands of asteroids that we've discovered, and there's probably in the you know 500,000 plus asteroids in the asteroid belt. So they've gone through all of this, this process, and they realize that these things are sort of the same, so they remove them from the planet list that you have to memorize, they get reclassified as asteroids, and they are today. All fine and good, then we find Neptune, then we find Pluto in 1930. And between 1930 and maybe um, the late 90s, we don't find anything else. And then we start finding these other worlds. We find things like uh, Makimaki and Quar and Haumea, and then we get Eris. And Eris is about the same size as Pluto, and actually we thought it was bigger than Pluto by just a touch um, until um, we had the New Horizons spacecraft fly by Pluto and then it sort of firmed up Pluto's size. And Pluto is a touch bigger uh, than Eris. But anyway, in this, in this debate in 2006, people sit down and say, okay, are all of these things going to also be planets because they're about Pluto-sized? And they're about in the same place in the solar system, uh, which is called uh, the, the Kuiper Belt. So let me show you what that looks like really fast. Uh, I'm going to take you instantly to the Earth, which is a convenient thing to do, and we'll bring all of our planets on. Oh, I turned off the Earth. Try that again. I have fun um, playing with too many screens, it seems. Let's try that again. Okay. Let's jump instantly to the Earth. One more time. Orbits are on. Fantastic. Earth is beautiful. We'll do a show on that later. Zooming away. Okay. So let's get... Let's build all of our orbits on. So we can see Earth's orbit. We can see the Martian orbit in here. There we go. Juggling too many, too many monitors, or too many windows, but not enough monitors, I think. And, okay, so you can see that the solar system, these are the major planets, and you can see that they're pretty nicely, you know, in this plane of the solar system, all fairly flat and hunky-dory, right? All more or less uh, within about maybe seven degrees of what's called the ecliptic plane. So let's throw Pluto's orbit in the loop and see where it sits. And you'll notice that it's inclined about 17 degrees, and that's eh, strange, but not doesn't exclude it necessarily. Okay, so uh, let's take a look as well at what might happen if we bring up uh, the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt is in here. And you will see that it is sort of filling in this region where Pluto is. You'll also notice that at times, if we get directly above the ecliptic plane, arbitrarily above, you'll notice that Pluto sometimes, just barely, is closer than Neptune. It actually crosses Neptune's orbit. So in considering all of this, uh, members of the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, sat down and they said, well, what is a planet? And it turned out that we had really poor definitions. So they came up with three criteria. They said, okay, in order to be a planet, you have to be round. Okay, fair enough. So through hydrostatic equilibrium, Pluto is rounded by enough mass, uh, so it's more or less spherical. It's uh, what's called an oblate spheroid, and the Earth is the same thing. So check that box. Cool. The, the next thing is that you have to orbit the Sun, and you can see that Pluto indeed does this, and the rest of the planets do. 
as well. That works nicely. And lastly, you have to have cleared your orbit of like-sized objects. Uh, that's sort of vague, and this is where Pluto sort of doesn't get uh, the mark here uh, by this technical definition, right? So you have to be a gravitational bully, and Pluto sort of isn't. Uh, really not at all, actually. It is the largest object in the Kuiper Belt, but it is not bullying, clearing its orbit of all of these objects, and it's also in Neptune's, or it crosses um, sort of by Neptune at points, even though it's not in Neptune's orbit specifically. So it isn't enough of a gravitational bully to be classified as a planet by these uh, parameters, and that's very frustrating to a lot of people. And I feel you, but uh, it sort of doesn't matter because planetary status is, and the definition is very, very arbitrary, right? Think of uh, classification of continents. You have a place like Greenland, which is part of Europe, and then you have Australia, which yes, has some other stuff to it, but it's basically Australia. Interesting. Then you have Europe and Asia, which are two separate continents, but they are touching. Sort of, sort of strange. So you can kind of make some arguments that that's all sorts of funky and fairly arbitrary. And in the same way, planets are also. So Pluto is technically classified as a dwarf planet, and it doesn't matter, quite honestly, uh, because Pluto is a very fascinating place regardless, and hopefully this presentation has uh, given you a little bit of uh, insight into that. Uh, one of the questions is, what is the Kuiper Belt? Uh, that would be spelled K-U-I-P-E-R, after Gerard Kuiper, uh, a Dutch guy, I believe. I uh, may be pronouncing that um, not very Dutch, but that's sort of the general way that astronomers pronounce it. Um, the Kuiper Belt is this collection of small worlds, mostly comets, um, in the outer solar system which resides past Neptune's orbit. Uh, so rather, rather far away. And Pluto is the largest of these objects, and for the reason that it's in there, the Kuiper Belt is not, um, or the, the Kuiper Belt is sort of the uh, deciding factor against Pluto's planetary status. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, or, or whatever it is. Again, it sort of doesn't matter. Okay, so let me see what else I have to show you. My time is running out. Um, I do want to point out that um, the New Horizons spacecraft is still going, even though it cruised by Pluto at, at very, very fast. It is still cruising on its way, and that's very exciting. Let me give you a quick, up-close-and-personal look at um, what we call a system overview, where we've brought you the spacecraft in here, and then can give you an idea of, uh, some, of some of its instruments. And then, uh, from there, um, let you take a look at what it's still doing. So um, ALICE is the UV spectrometer, which basically is looking at a variety of things, including a uh, very thin atmosphere of Pluto. Uh, RALPH is one of the imagers that is used to study um, surface geology and morphology. REX is um, the radio science experiment, and it looks at atmospheric temperature and pressure uh, all the way down to the surface. Atmospheric pressure is very, very, very minimal, um, but very interesting. It's also used to beam back um, data to the Earth. LORI is the long-range reconnaissance imager, and arguably the most important thing. Uh, it's basically a telescopic camera, and that's what all those amazing pictures came from. There's sort of an add-on called MVIC uh, that allows us to get the color imagery as well. SWAP, Solar Wind Around Pluto, is something that looks at the solar wind interacting with different things. Uh, PEPSI looks at the energetic particles in uh, the sort of atmosphere around them, and uh, this is something that uh, was used on the Cassini spacecraft, uh, which we'll be talking about next week. Plug for next week. The student dust counter is actually made at uh, the University, University of Colorado at Boulder, and it studies density, composition, and the nature of energetic particles and plasmas. Um, and that's it. New Horizons was a very, very light spacecraft, a very cheap spacecraft, only about $700 million, $750 million, which is a lot less than the 2.5 to $3 billion that, the, that Mars gets and, and Saturn gets and that sort of thing. 
Um, so it was a very cheap mission that gave us all sorts of insight into the last of the classical planets, um, or the last of the planets, depending on how you look at it, or um, the largest of the dwarf planets, or however you want to say it. Again, it sort of, it sort of doesn't matter. Um, it flew by another object called uh, Erikoth, which I don't have time to show you, um, on January 1st of 2019. But what I can show you um, is what it's doing right now. It's actually using parallax because it's so far away from the Earth, about 47 astronomical units, so uh, 47 times farther away from the Sun and Earth than uh, the Earth is from the Sun. And so us on the Earth, we look uh, at uh, nearby stars and see a view against the background stars. And New Horizons, because it's so far away, we've got this really large baseline in between, and we're actually able to see these stars against a different background. And so it's allowing us to take better measurements of distance using this, even though this is a very, very small angle. Uh, we can use trigonometry with these measurements to give us better, uh, very, very high precision measurements of the distances of these closer stars away from us, and that's very cool. So even though it's shooting off into the very far outskirts of our solar system never to return, it's still doing science and can continue to do science uh, for a little while longer. Um, a question is, if it was launched so long ago, how is it still going? Well, it was launched incredibly quickly, and even though it's almost out of fuel, it doesn't need fuel to keep going, it just needs fuel to change pointing direction. So if you don't have a force acting on you, and in space you essentially don't, uh, then you just keep going until something acts on you. So until you run into something, it will keep going even after it stopped talking to us because it's too far away. So that's super cool. Uh, James says, does Pluto ever have a chance of becoming a planet again? Um, officially, maybe. All, all fun. And on that note, I'm going to send you uh, on your way. So if you have any last questions, feel free to ask in the comments. I'll be perusing those uh, later tonight and in the coming week um, and can answer those for you as well. But uh, thank you for joining me this evening. I hope I gave you um, way more information about Pluto than uh, you ever wanted. And Remember that science never stops, not at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, uh, nor anywhere for that matter. So stay safe, enjoy your evening, and I look forward to seeing you next week at 7 p.m., and we'll talk all about Saturn. Thanks so much. Good night.